So perfect. Why don't we go ahead and get started then? Thanks, Chris. And okay. uh, we have a, an hour and a half, right? An hour and a half. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So plenty of time for a discussion. Yeah. Good. Great. A lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, so let me just introduce you briefly, Thank and you. then uh, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to one of our final events in the East Central European Studies this uh, center this uh, semester. My name is Chris Case. I'm the co-director of the East Central European Studies Center. My co-director and colleague uh, Christopher Harwood is with us as well. Um, I'm the lecturer in Polish at Columbia University. Christopher Harwood is the lecturer in Czech. Um, during this academic year, we headed up the East Central European um, Center. And we are pleased to welcome to uh, today to us, uh, Marcel Radoslav Garbos, um, who is a historian um, and uh, a historian of social and political thought in the late Russian Empire and in the Soviet Union. Um, he also has a broad interest in comparative history of empires and in visions of post imperial order in the modern world. Um, most importantly for us, uh, Marcel is the current uh, East Von Deak visiting assistant professor in the East Central European Studies Center, and he is currently teaching two courses for us, one on self-determination um, in the 20th century, uh, looking at the Wilsonian and Leninist uh, paradigms, I believe, after World War I, and then one on um, cities, a fascinating course on 14 different cities. Uh, in East Central Europe, uh, the course is entitled Crucibles of Modernity. So city every week, right? Yeah, so city, yeah, yeah. sometimes two in a row. I can testify that, uh, well, at least if the um, volume of students at your office hours is a testimony to the popularity of the courses, then they seem to be going very well. That's been good. Um, wonderful. Um, uh, Marcel has a, he's a graduate of Bard College at Simon Rock in Massachusetts, and he also holds a PhD in history from Harvard University. Um, and he will be speaking to us today about uh, federalism in the late uh, Russian Empire, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, the visions of world order. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. Let's hear it for Thank you, Chris, uh, for the <clears throat> warm introduction. And I appreciate the chance to meet with all of you here and uh, share really what is uh, kind of a condensed prospectus for this project on which I'm just embarking right now. Uh, hopefully a book link project with a couple of uh, maybe articles around the way, uh, along the way. Um, this is really the first time that I've been able to meet with a community of colleagues though, to talk about this. Uh, so I would really appreciate either your feedback on kind of the general structure of the inquiry, the questions and the methods, and uh, maybe a little bit as well on the specific case studies uh, that I've chosen uh, to sort of underpin the, the broader uh, questions of, of uh, this project. Um, I should say at the start, you know, that the project really is an international history of federalist thought in the late Russian empire. And when I say late Russian empire, I have in mind not just the territory of Imperial Russia itself and its various borderlands. Um, but I like the, this map because of the railway networks. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of the international ecology of exile and emigre colonies that forms around the world. Uh, already in the 19th century with people like Bakunin, uh, some of the, the, the populists like Alexander Herzen, uh, but especially uh, during and after the Civil War years in uh, 1917 to 21. Uh, and what got me into this project uh, really was my dissertation, which was looking at sort of the um, uh, dispersion of uh, federalist thinkers from late Imperial Russia and how they continued to pursue uh, internationalist projects for Eurasian reorganization, even after they had been uh, forced out of the Russian imperial space by the Bolsheviks. Uh, so it is, um, oh, you know, do you want to close it, Chris, or are we good? Oh, yeah. Just a little bit, it's fine. No, no, no. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, so, so in that sense, I was, I was uh, trying to look at uh, the Federalist projects, Internationalist projects of 1917 to 1918, uh, mainly between the, the February and October revolutions, uh, not just being a prelude to the Soviet Union, uh, but being this uh, really vibrant moment of uh, intellectual collaboration. Hi. We're just getting started, so no worries. Um, as a moment of intellectual collaboration, uh, but one that ultimately spread uh, globally during the 20s and 30s. And I did this mainly in the context of the uh, Polish-sponsored Promethean movement, which was this uh, network of uh, mostly ethnically non-Russian exiles from the borderlands, uh, coordinated by the Polish military intelligence staff between 1926 and 1939, roughly, uh, that generated all of these ideas of cross-borderland collaboration uh, against the Bolsheviks, and even ideas for regional and uh, continental federations. 
Uh, so sort of the ideas of, of um, geopolitical organization uh, interested me a great deal. Hi, Sasha. Hi. Um, the way that I've come to think of it, though, um, uh, these these days, uh, it's th this project really responds to the uh, so-called new imperial history of the last 20 or 25 years uh, that we would associate with Fred Cooper and uh, Jane Burbank down at New York University. Uh, some of our historians here at Conde University, uh, Susan Peterson does this uh, as well, uh, thinking um, really not just in terms of the 20th century as a time when empires collapsed into nation states, when these uh, lumbering multinational conglomerates <clears throat> fell apart into more vigorous, modernizing, uh, smaller kind of units. But rather, rather to think about what possibilities of post-imperial order uh, emerged out of moments of imperial crisis and collapse, uh, like the world wars, like the revolutions in, in uh, Russia in 1917 to 1918. And what Burbank and Cooper have really done is to argue that uh, decolonization and imperial collapse should be treated more as a process than just as a moment in which empires cleaved into nation states. Uh, that in many cases, uh, imperial collapse was preceded by a period in which uh, both people from borderlands and colonies and from metropoles were trying to rework the imperial territories, uh, maybe to transform empires into federations, confederations, republics, uh, other kinds of supposedly more uh, level or lateral uh, polity uh, that would maybe redress the histories of conquest and annexation that uh, usually led to the formation uh, of empires. And uh, Frederick Cooper specifically, uh, and a really thought-provoking book from uh, about a decade ago, uh, looked at French West Africa, roughly from 1944 to 1960. And he made the argument that the collapse of sort of this West African conglomerate under French colonial rule into this handful of different nation states that we now know on the map, whether uh, Senegal, Mali, uh, Mauritania, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, all of these countries, that, that this collapse was preceded by really ambitious attempts at transforming the French empire into a federation, confederation, potentially a community of nations. Uh, and both uh, metropolitan actors like Charles de Gaulle and uh, colonial nationalists uh, in West Africa, like Mamadou Dia, uh, wanted to maintain the federation uh, or the empire as a federation, though for different purposes. Uh, the metropolitan uh, leaders really wanted the raw materials, the cheap labor, uh, maybe uh, not on imperial terms, but they still wanted to keep the economic uh, interconnection. Whereas those um, leaders in, in the different constituent regions of French West Africa uh, didn't want to go it alone, just as independent nation states. They knew that they were economically and politically quite vulnerable. So they valued this kind of uh, amalgamation and wanted to um, keep the empire's territory and resources and population together, but by other means, uh, and ideally within a, a federation. And what Cooper points out and what really informs uh, the inquiry behind this uh, project that I'm sharing with you today uh, is the idea of federation as a kind of polity uh, between empire and nation state. So one that maintains the imperial amalgamations, these very uh, vast uh, sprawling uh, kind of uh, territories and, and, and networks of, of people and resources, uh, while at the same time recognizing self-determination to some degree and uh, allowing for at least uh, some form of self-governance uh, in, in the former colonies. Um, other, other work has been done on uh, South, Southern Africa or Southeastern Africa and the um, British Central African Federation of 1953 to uh, 1963. Uh, Michael Collins has done that uh, specifically. And uh, recently as well, work on transforming, uh, transforming the Austro-Hungarian Empire into a United States of Greater Austria or some kind of federal uh, union uh, in which there would be ethnic or national devolution alongside some, some overarching structures. Now, I think all of these examples um, sound a little bit disparate and probably you're wondering, well, how do we get from French West Africa and, and uh, the Central African Federation to, to Russia? Uh, the way that uh, scholars like Cooper have uh, and, and Burbank have uh, framed this is in terms of thinking about the 20th century, again, not just a time of empires collapsing into nation states, but as a constellation of so-called federal moments of periods of time in which uh, efforts were made at transforming uh, empires into federations. Uh, many of them were unsuccessful in the long run, didn't went out on the map. Um, and that makes it uh, makes for an interesting provocation in the Russian case, uh, because with the late Russian Empire and uh, the Soviet Union, that's one of the few instances in which most of a former empire actually gets reorganized into a state that describes itself as federal. Uh, the Soviet Union, of course, we know is, is very centralized. Uh, most Western scholars wouldn't describe it as a proper federation. Uh, but nevertheless, that's how it was imagined by the Bolsheviks or presented, and uh, that's also how some anti-colonial nationalists uh, in the interwar period, like the Trinidadian Marxist uh, George Padmore, uh, thought about the Soviet Union. Uh, Padmore writing in the aftermath of World War II, a bit like Subhash Chandra Bose in India in the 1930s, 
uh, argued that the British Empire should be transformed into a socialist commonwealth, uh, as he called it, along the uh, lines of the Soviet Union, that the different uh, non-white co uh, colonial territories should be industrialized and given uh, well, what he at least perceived as the autonomy enjoyed by the non-Russian republics of the, uh, the Soviet Union. So these examples, uh, you know, with, with Padmore looking at the Soviet Union for a model for, for post-imperial order uh, in, in the British Empire, I think it's interesting because it points to these uh, federal moments as being interconnected in some way. Um, some maybe more than others, but at least that we can think of uh, repertoires of federal organization uh, circulating globally at this time and being borrowed from one uh, imperial context to the other. And that really was the provocation uh, from, from Cooper and Burbank that uh, made me think of how exactly we could uh, integrate uh, the Russian Empire into this global ecology of, of federal moments, uh, whether in terms of the uh, pre-World War I period with uh, Austria-Hungary, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire as the major sort of uh, Eurasian land empires, uh, in which there are also experiments with autonomy and, and federation, or more broadly in the 20th century, uh, also with the uh, colonial empires. Um, one way of doing that, again, would be to look at the anti-colonial nationalists who were intrigued by uh, the Soviet model and wanted to apply that to uh, Britain or France. Uh, but when I thought about how to integrate uh, the imperial Russian and Soviet spaces into this uh, discussion about federal moments, I found myself going constantly back to 1917 and 1918. Um, during that period, the Soviet model of ethnic federalism that's formally adopted by Lenin and Stalin in January of 1918 is still just one federal possibility among many uh, in the Russian Empire. Uh, the socialist revolutionaries and more agrarian uh, socialist uh, grouping with their primary base in the Russian-speaking peasantry uh, <clears throat> had adopted a federation as a, a tenant of, of, of their program or a principle um, <clears throat> already right at the turn of the century, around 1900, 1901. And their idea of federation was much more decentralized than of the Bolsheviks. Uh, they imagined federation as a developmental necessity because all of the different nationalities in their view uh, had different modes of production. It wasn't just that one capitalist mode of production was integrating all of the empire into a single productive unit, but that Ukraine, Caucasus, Central Asia, uh, Poland, and other uh, nationally or regionally defined areas were really on uh, varied trajectories of development, whether capitalist or non-capitalist. Uh, and for the socialist revolutionaries, uh, socialism is defined more as the abolition of exploitation uh, than as a stage of history, the way that uh, Marxists and social democrats like the Bolsheviks tend to see it. So going feudalism, capitalism, socialism, and then communism when, when uh, class society is totally abolished. Uh, socialist revolutionaries uh, saw federalism as necessary precisely because they understood Russia as being developmentally uh, pluricentric and very uh, uh, variegated. Uh, of course, the socialist re revolutionaries don't win out. Uh, they tried to federalize uh, the Russian Empire uh, briefly in the Constituent Assembly in January of 1918, but that gets shuttered by the Bolsheviks. Uh, and an, an interesting act of uh, intellectual appropriation and transmission, the Bolsheviks take the federal model of the socialist revolutionaries and integrate it into their own uh, program, um, which I find as, uh, as, as being fascinating precisely because the Soviet Union was relatively long lived in the 20th century. Uh, well, we can say almost 70 years from uh, 22 until, until 91. Um, but that sort of historical enormity of the Soviet Union kind of, um, it tends to project a shadow on what was going on in 1917. Uh, we don't always pursue the alternate possibilities in much depth. Uh, just because the, the Bolsheviks, again, went out on the map, uh, really the alternate federal models are only uh, beginning to be uh, reconstructed now. What really struck me, though, about uh, the social, socialist revolutionaries, both Russian and Ukrainian in 1917, though, uh, was that they really believed that uh, the uh, federal models that could be implemented in the Russian Empire could be adapted from the British Empire, from the settler dominions like Canada, Australia, South Africa, from the United States, uh, and also from uh, different federations in German-speaking Europe, uh, Switzerland or, or uh, Germany itself. Uh, this is something that we don't see with the Bolsheviks, because when Lenin and Stalin embark on this project, they emphatically say the Soviet Union is breaking from the bourgeois democratic federations of the world. It's a completely novel project. Uh, and in part, you know, that's accurate of what they're saying, because the, the federal structure of the Soviet Union was meant to be uh, transitional. It was meant to be a temporary phase on the way to what Stalin calls socialist unitarism. We could argue, of course, that the Bolsheviks do achieve socialist unitarism in terms of the centralization of the state and the military and the economy, while retaining the outward structures of, of uh, federalism and giving some limited autonomy to the, to the borderlands. Uh, but this, for me, raised this, this uh, important question of where are the different federal models of 1917 were coming from exactly? Uh, 
And for me, uh, you know, from, from reading just the socialist revolutionary writings and programs of that time, it's clear that there is a really interesting history of intellectual circulation and borrowing going on in this case that is far from evident if you just focus on the Bolsheviks. Uh, again, because the Bolsheviks emphasize the uniqueness of, of that uh, project. Um, with the socialist revolutionaries, I started to look a little bit earlier in 1917 and kind of focus on these so-called middle months from the February Revolution to the October Revolution. Uh, during this time, the Russian SRs were one of the biggest uh, parties and ultimately win the biggest plurality of the votes in the election to the Constituent Assembly in November of 1918, uh, of uh, 1917, sorry. Um, they adopt formal motions uh, endorsing the German or the American model of federalism and saying that it can be uh, adapted to Russia and uh, really that uh, these more uh, developed economies uh, can, can, be, can be models for uh, uh, the Russian case. Uh, the Ukrainian socialist revolutionaries have a Congress as well uh, in uh, Kiev in September of 1917, and that draws uh, representatives from something like 15 or 16 nationalities. Uh, those are the people who are physically present. Uh, there is an even wider range who uh, receive the invitations to come to Kiev but can't make it for logistical reasons, uh, all the way from Buryatia, from the Yakut uh, nationality in, in the Siberia and the Far East. Uh, so for me, it's, it's, it becomes interesting that uh, federalism and federal ideas form a kind of common language for these uh, very different uh, parties that are active in, in uh, 1917. And they very, uh, I would say, you know, maybe tentatively agree that a federal model is the right one, although for very different reasons uh, than, than those arrived at uh, by uh, the Bolsheviks. So on one hand, we have a story uh, already in 1917 of intellectual borrowing and connections between uh, federations and, and the Anglophone and German-speaking worlds. Uh, this is a little bit of um, maybe offensive uh, uh, drawing showing um, Mikhail Khrushchevsky, the leader of the Ukrainian Central Rada, um, as uh, St. Michael, bringing uh, federation and civilization to the barbaric peoples of the world. And when my uh, dissertation or doctoral advisor said he originally sent this to me, uh, I didn't realize the significance um, of, of this way of portraying uh, Khrushchevsky as, as a messianic presence. What I later realized is that in 1917, if we look at Ukrainian and Russian socialist revolutionary resolutions, they all envision uh, Russia at first importing the federal models from abroad, but then exporting them after they've been implemented. So the argument actually is that Russia has a world historic mission as a post-imperial polity in the making, uh, really to create a, a kind of fraternity among nationalities and uh, then to use that model on the international stage uh, once World War I is over. Uh, the idea is that the models being developed in uh, the Russian Empire in, in mid to late 1917 could be uh, examples for Austria-Hungary, for uh, Germany potentially, or, or um, uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but they're even more ambitious in saying that uh, other parts of the world uh, could uh, learn from Russia once Russia succeeds in, in federalizing itself. So what orig originally for me was very much a story of um, the sort of uh, import of federal ideas uh, to the Russian Empire and its border events in, in 1917 uh, became one in which the ideas are circulating, uh, that, that Russia is not just uh, receiving, but also uh, at least the ideas that Russia will export these models uh, once the, the revolution has been won. So for me, that, that uh, really uh, opened the question of how federal ideas are moving physically through different intellectual networks around the world and how Russia really is not just on the periphery of this phenomenon, but it is really a point of uh, interaction, kind of a confluence of different uh, federalist currents uh, that, are, that are circulating uh, globally at this time. Um, I would say as well that by focusing on uh, sort of the networks and, and the groups that didn't went out on the board um, or on the, on the map, we can get away from sort of the state-centered narratives of socialist federalism in the 20th century. Um, since the early 90s, since the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia all fell apart within a very short period in 91 to 92, uh, there's been a very large uh, social scientific and historical literature uh, in English and also, also in German about uh, sort of the passing of the species of socialist federations mm -hmm. that were once so prominently placed uh, for most of, most of the 20th century in Eurasia, but then which fell apart in rapid succession. And a lot of these uh, studies, which I think are extremely val valuable, um, you know, they kind of tend to diagnose uh, these forms of socialist federalism as kind of sham federalisms that were very centralized in practice. Uh, that's part of the reason that they fell apart when they were maybe uh, liberalized in the Soviet case with, with uh, Gorbachev, uh, that opens the way for nationalist mobilization and uh, kind of uh, movements against the, the, the centralized state. Um, but what, what I find interesting is that if, um, if the 
scholarship on, on socialist federalism that uh, focuses on the states and state actors uh, tells us a lot about how these systems fell apart. It doesn't really give us a very compelling uh, analysis of how socialism and federalism came to be coupled in the first place, which for me is a much a more diffuse and kind of global question than one that just ends in a couple of places in Eurasia uh, in the early 90s. Uh, and socialism and federalism, I, I construe very broadly. Um, I'm interested in how the terms are being used uh, at the time and uh, what it is exactly that attracts people from different socialist uh, groupings and tendencies to turn to federalism. Uh, because the connection is not a natural one necessarily. If we think about you know, uh, Marxism, ideas about sort of a centralized party, uh, centralized uh, proletarian movement. Um, Marx, at least before the time of the Paris Commune in 71, uh, is... is uh, critical of, of federalist uh, thinkers like Buckwood or, or Herzen, and, and they're also very critical of Marx. Um, in that sense, I, I, I think that uh, when we look at the federal movements in the Russian imperial Russian space, uh, a lot of the time in the mid to late, uh, maybe, maybe I should say mid 19th century, uh, federalism is a phenomenon that we see with the more agrarian socialist groupings, uh, with, with uh, people like uh, yeah, I think Alexander Harrison is a good example with um, and Mikhail Drachomanov in, in the Ukrainian case, with uh, Boris Vodimanovsky in, in the Polish case. And all of these uh, agrarian socialists are saying that federalism is the right way to go because Western capitalism, Western industrial capitalism, tends more towards this kind of uh, despotic centralization of resources, of people, of, of, of political power. And the argument there is that Russia, by virtue of its, its socioeconomic backwardness, can bypass or avoid altogether the corrosive uh, forms of Western uh, capitalist development that have led to the creation of huge industrial proletariats that are totally uh, shut out of, of, of uh, property accumulation that are terribly oppressed. Uh, so it does originally start out as an agrarian socialist phenomenon. Uh, but what interests me a lot is uh, when Russia begins to industrialize at the end of the 19th century, uh, that uh, some of the more proletarian socialist movements start to turn to federalism. Uh, not the Bolsheviks or the Mensheviks, the Russian Social Democrats, but the Ukrainian Social Democrats do. And a lot of Polish Marxists around the time of uh, Revolution of 1905 uh, begin to embrace federalism. And I want to understand as, uh, as well uh, why that was. Uh, the Poles in particular argued, um, uh, partly from the point of view of, of Poland being one of the first parts of Russia to industrialize, that industrialization uh, doesn't um, won't just amalgamate the whole Russian empire into one kind of overarching pr uh, productive unit, but that there will be different forms of capitalism in different places, and that capitalism is kind of a constellation of, of uh, different regional and national economies. That's kind of against the point of view of the, the Bolsheviks uh, later, who would argue that really there's an all imperial form of integration uh, going on. Uh, so in that sense, I, I realized um, maybe the best way to analyze this is not by focusing on the state institutions and the state actors, but the networks, the intellectual networks, and specifically uh, socialist networks that are very internationally interconnected. Um, the first kind of framework is, is with the, the time of the Second International, uh, from 1889 to 1916, roughly. And I get the sense that the Russian uh, socialists who are borrowing the federal models from the United States or British Empire or Germany uh, are moving around uh, between Russia and continental Europe and also sometimes crossing the oceans. Uh, the best example I have of that is, is Mark Vishniak, who is one of the main uh, authors of the Socialist Revolutionary Party's Federalist uh, Resolutions. And he spends a lot of time in Germany and uh, I think maybe even in Switzerland, uh, kind of wandering abroad in the years that he's exiled from Russia around uh, 1907 and 1906, around the same time that Lenin is, is out there drawing very different conclusions from, from what he's uh, looking at. Um, I'll show you, yeah, just the, the kind of chronology. So for me, the Second International was sort of the first place uh, to begin. Um, and I think when we use the kind of the framing of the Second International as a broader trajectory in which to embed the revolutions of 1917, uh, 1917 and specifically the federal proposals of that, of that year uh, appear much less as kind of this endpoint uh, of the Tsarist system or beginning of the Soviet system, but rather as kind of a point of inflection along a broader trajectory. So we have 1917, this kind of laboratory of federal reorganization in Russia, uh, and it's preceded by this series of arcs of different socialist groups that are um, moving around uh, uh, different parts of, of uh, continental Europe uh, and, and uh, Britain as well, uh, and, and moving these, these ideas uh, across the borders. Uh, Returning sort of the, to, to the chronology of my dissertation, I didn't want to end the story in 1917, 1918, or even in 1922 with the formation of the Soviet Union. Uh, what I realized is that the federal ideas that are being uh, elaborated in 1917, that don't ultimately prevail on the map, uh, 
uh, later continue uh, to, to survive in emigration when the non-Bolshevik socialists uh, flee abroad during the civil wars. And I've identified maybe three kind of currents. Um, one of them is Bolshevik, of course, of the Communist International, which would connect us with people like Padmore and, and uh, the, the colonial um, Marxists. Uh, but the other two that don't really get looked at are the Labour and Socialist International, which is sort of the more moderate social democratic, like German or Austrian social democratic international. Uh, British Labour Party is part of it as well. Uh, that's sort of, um, it claims to be a successor to the Second International and a competitor to the Communist International. Uh, and that is that is interesting because the Russian socialist revolutionaries, Ukrainian socialist revolutionaries, uh, Georgian Mensheviks, and all of these parties, including some Polish socialist parties, uh, continue to be affiliated with uh, one another through through the uh, LSI, Labor and Socialist International. And something I've written about a lot um, in the past in my dissertation is this Promethean movement, this Eurasian network of emigres uh, from the non-Russian borderlands that gets organized by uh, the Polish uh, state. Uh, Piłsudski, of course, is a big figure in, in sponsoring this uh, movement. And uh, again, these uh, thinkers are maybe less interested in uh, reforming Russia um, and more interested in kind of breaking it apart, uh, breaking away the different borderlands uh, that have been conquered by the Bolsheviks in the civil wars, and uh, thinking about ways of organizing the borderlands uh, together against uh, what they consider to be, to be the despotism of, of uh, Moscow or the uh, Russian center, as they call it. So again, uh, kind of the way that I think about this is in terms of these trajectories or these arcs uh, that maybe um, make us re revisit the traditional chronology or the traditional understanding of, of uh, 1917. And just in the last couple of minutes before we get into the uh, discussion, uh, I'll share with you, you know, sort of the hypotheses um, that, that I've been developing so far. Um, I think uh, definitely that the issue of development and uh, developmental time is extremely important for understanding why uh, socialists turn to these federal models in the Russian Empire. Um, specifically, the perception of Russia as a space of heterogeneous social development. The idea that, for instance, uh, some supposedly less developed nationalities of Central Asia or Siberia are behind the more industrialized or developed nationalities of the Western borderlands. Um, the, word, the place that I discovered that maybe most prominently was with the Polish Marxists. They're writing, you know, from the point of view of uh, Warsaw or Łódź or these big textile centers, industrial centers uh, around the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. They're looking eastward over Russia and saying, you can't have just one uh, centralized system of government because this territory is so diverse and so unevenly developed. But what they propose is not a federation in which every nationality uh, participates equally. They argue that there has to be a, a kind of system of tiers of autonomy, that the most developed peoples can have basically almost complete sovereignty approaching that of, a, of a, an independent state. Whereas there are lower tiers uh, of, of more agrarian peoples supposedly who need to mature or develop before they can uh, control more than just their kind of local social or economic issues. Uh, and then they, the, the Poles talk about the, the wild or savage tribes of the Far East and say that uh, these groups really can practice their own customary law as long as it matches the, the civil law to some degree. It doesn't you know, flagrantly violate the uh, law of, of, of the Federation and that their integration to the federal system is very far away. Uh, so that interested me because um, the Bolshevik model of federalism emphasizes very quickly ferrying different nationalities from feudalism or early capitalism to socialism through this federal structure. Uh, the socialist revolutionaries and also the Polish Marxists are much more gradual. They envision a long-term uh, process of federalization in which the many different nationalities will gradually develop into higher forms of, of autonomy. Uh, at least that's the, the project um, in, in 1905 or 1906, which surprises me because um, when we think about Polish socialism and federalism, uh, Piłsudski, of course, Józef Piłsudski is the main character in that narrative. And Piłsudski, writing at this time, argued that the federation in which Poland will be involved is not one encompassing the whole Russian empire, but just the westernmost borderlands that used to be part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Poland, with the Jewish populations uh, spread, spread around. And Piłsudski explicitly argues in, in 1896, if I remember correctly, that the rest of Russia is so backward and so agrarian that it cannot possibly enter a, a federation on equal footing with these Western borderlands. But precisely because Russia is industrializing quite rapidly in the 1890s, uh, unevenly, of course, and kind of inchoately, but also quite quickly, it's, there's a state-driven program of industrialization in the 1890s. Other Polish Marxists are saying, no, actually, what Piłsudski is arguing is no longer valid. Uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, the other uh, 
uh, manufacturing cities of, of European Russia, they're converging with Poland developmentally uh, quite quickly. And it's possible for Poland and the rest of Russia to be within a common federation. Um, the interesting twist there, though, is that for these Polish socialists, they're arguing that if Russia forms a federation, that'll be the basis for a pan-European federation, including Germany and Austria-Hungary as well. And once Russia, uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary join the pan-European federation, uh, Poland can be united within ethnographic borders as an independent republic within a European pan-European federation. So there are different layers going on here that interest me a lot. That they're thinking again about not just uh, federal models, just like that you can represent in two dimensions as like a relations of sovereignty or territorial boundaries. They're thinking of uh, federal federalism as moving through time and unfolding and developing over time, which is for me like the most intriguing dimension of the whole uh, project. Um, I know I'm uh, uh, running out of uh, time right here. I want to see it just if um, there are a couple of points about the historiography. Uh, I would say the important point for me is to be able to connect the history of the land empires, the Eurasian land empires, with the history of the uh, maritime empires, such as the British Empire. And the United States you know, is a continental empire, you can say, but also has uh, overseas territories. Of course, it doesn't acknowledge that it's an empire, but uh, it functions as an empire very often. Uh, Germany, of course, is also kind of a hybrid empire, having a continental uh, kind of uh, borderlands in, in, in the east, but also having the territories uh, gained after the, the Berlin Conference in the 1880s. Um, so I'm interested in kind of uh, looking at how models from uh, maritime empires still inform the federal ideas of, of people in Russia, uh, and maybe kind of to think about how that analytic distinction among different categories of empires um, that we kind of take for granted right now maybe wasn't uh, in the minds of the people who were thinking. Um, more than 100 years ago. Um, I would say, yeah, the other major point for me, uh, sort of drawing on the work of Faith Hillis, who wrote um, the, the, the book about uh, exiles, the, uh, about utopia, and Maria Todorova, who also wrote a book about utopian ideas and socialism. Uh, both of these scholars have really compellingly argued that uh, the idea of a, a fundamental gap between the West and Russia um, at least in socialist parlance or socialist understandings, is really something that only comes after the Bolsheviks are victorious in the civil wars in 21, 22, but really only in the Cold War after 45, uh, that in the time of the Second International, uh, socialists from Western Europe and socialists for Russia considered it possible to exchange developmental models. Uh, they believed that uh, forms of social development on display in Western and Central Europe could also take place in Russia. Uh, so this argument, you know, by, by, by Hillis and Todorova, has been to uh, really integrate the imperial Russian space into an international conversation uh, about socialist ideas and ideas of development uh, to see in some ways what the, the Russian context can contribute to what we understand about a global history that usually focuses more on the Atlantic world, uh, Europe and, and North America, uh, rather than, than the rest of uh, Eurasia. I think that um, was the, the really the, the main um, thrust of the, the project that I've covered so far. I want to show you this map as well that came out in the 1890s. Uh, it's the, the general map of uh, sort of um, industrial factory production or industry in the Russian Empire. And we're probably familiar with the ethnographic map of Russia at the time, like these different blotches of ethno-linguistic groups in the borderlands. But when the socialists uh, especially are thinking about uh, how to reorganize Russia, um, they're asking the question about whether different regions are converging or diverging with each other in terms of development. Are they showing similar forms of social development? Are they maybe uh, not doing that? Uh, are they crystallizing into bigger regions? Are they crystallizing into one all imperial territory? So the question at this time, again, uh, is, is really one about trajectories of development and uh, how to keep together this vast imperial Russian space uh, within some kind of post-imperial polity that will allow uh, development to take place differently in different places. And I think that is uh, really the main point um, of the project, that this is uh, federalism is not just a way of thinking about uh, sovereignty and uh, territory, but it's a way of thinking about time and development uh, and structuring developmental time. So I know it's about uh, 30 minutes that I've been speaking, so I, I, I would like, love to turn it over. Um, definitely appreciate any feedback either on sort of the general formulation or the sort of specific um, case studies, Polish, Russian, Ukrainian that I've mentioned uh, so far. So. I really do appreciate it. Thank you all to myself for that very rich presentation. Thank you, Chris. Um, <laughs> let's open it up to questions. Um, I can imagine that 
there are quite a few. Uh, please go ahead. Please. I, uh, my name is Susan Smith Peter. I'm a historian of Russia and I've been writing about regions for uh, 20 years. So I'm very interested in, in this project. And uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated and I kind of want to read all the stuff that you're, that you're talking about. Uh, you know, the idea of the SRs and the influence on the structure of the Soviet Union is really interesting. And I've written uh, kind of an overview of regionalism in Russia called uh, the Six Waves of Russian mm -hmm. Regionalism, where I cover 1830s, 1860s, 1890s, 1920s, uh, and then the 1970s and 2000s. Um, we will to send everybody, uh, actually, the offering if you're interested. Um, and that actually dovetails very well with what uh, Beethelis and Todorova are saying, because I'm also arguing that there's a, a real kind of uh, similarity or, you know, Russia and the West are going pretty much along the same lines until Stalin. Mm -hmm. There's a big convergence with Stalin. And they have a lot, there's a lot of back and forth between the two uh, and a lot of um, kind of you know, um, just connections, you yeah. know. Um, and one of the things that I, I find really important here is, is this dovetails very well with what you're saying, is that that kind of history allows us to go away from the state. You know, so much is about state formation, the development of the state, and that blinds us to other kinds of questions. So I find your work really very exciting. Um, and one of the things when I was putting together this uh, overview of history that seemed really important to me was the moment of the Civil War mm -hmm. and the loss of the SR model. Mm -hmm. So that is, and I don't think it's been really conceptualized, and your work seems to move towards that conceptualization, mm -hmm. but I think it's incredibly um, consequential that the SRs fail in the Russian North, uh, that the um, uh, in, in Siberia, they also fail, and the SRs are not able to get a mass uh, following mm -hmm. at all. Uh, they are kind of too intellectual and everything. So when they when they fail, basically their whole trajectory is destroyed. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, when you realize that that was a possibility, you realize like the historiography. There's no you know, continuation of that historiography. There's no continuation of that developmental thinking within Russia, although it sounds like there is in, in uh, Poland. So I guess my question is, you know, how do you see this kind of uh, periodization, this kind of looking at networks instead of state, how do you see that as, as challenging the, the larger, um, sort, of, sort of the larger narratives of, of Russian history? Oh, it's absolutely. Um, you no, know, I, I appreciate the, the comments as well, and I, I'll definitely look at the the the, um, the off print. I, I, I'd love to read that. Um, yes, in terms of the the periodization, um, it, it it is a a, a good question. I, I I'm trying to remember um, if it's uh, Elizabeth uh, it's Elizabeth White or another scholar who wrote on the SRs. Um, she she had this book about the uh, Prague SR circles, and uh, her argument really was that. Um, you know, the, we should look at the SRs not just as being uh, on the periphery or being uh, evicted from Russia, uh, but, you know, that they're, they're very closely following the, the events that are happening within Russia and following the policies uh, under new economic policy, later collectivization. Uh, so when we, we, we focus on their writings uh, in the 20s and 30s, um, it is still a very legitimate and important branch of Russian or, you know, Soviet intellectual history. Uh, that the intellectual production is happening not just in the Soviet Union, but it's it's going on uh, abroad as well. And I think uh, that was one of the, the earliest books that I read when I was getting into my dissertation. And uh, she made a very strong case that emigres and emigre colonies, um, you know, we can maybe map them onto the state-centered uh, periodization, but they still have their own rhythms. And there are all of these rivalries among the uh, the, the exiles and the, the actual, the physical material structure of the exile networks um, is, is shifting a lot. Uh, with the Promethean movement, depending upon you know whether a certain regime comes to power um, in Japan or in uh, Finland or, or wherever, um, the Prometheans might be getting more funding in one place um, or, or, or another. So, uh, for me, it was really about the you know the exiles not just kind of floating outside of the Soviet Union, but being embedded in these material networks that are connected with uh, the borderlands and connected with uh, different parts of the world. Um, I'm thinking in my my own example with the, the periodization. Um, well, with Prometheism, I can say in Poland. Uh, 
The ideas uh, definitely changed during and after collectivization. Um, the expectation in, in the 20s is that the Soviet Union will fall rather, rather quickly. It's still very poor and very agrarian. Uh, with collectivization, though, these Ukrainian and, and Polish writers, for the most part, um, they're trying to come up with uh, theories about the Soviet economy and when it will go into a crisis. Uh, they're trying to um, anticipate, based on Soviet foreign policy, if uh, the Soviet Union and Japan will go to war, or if uh, Germany and the Soviet Union will have a, a struggle. Um, so in that sense, it, it, it does um, overlap with the, the periodization of what's going on in the Soviet Union, but uh, gives us, I think, um, yeah, also also complications with those narratives. Maybe the better example is with the Second International, though, with um, what, what Hillis and Todorov cover uh, in the in the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties, before uh, the the end of uh, World War One. Uh, in that context, uh, that definitely allows for, for looking at Russia as being more more integrated. Um, and yeah, in, in in the work that I've been doing, certainly it, it repositioned nineteen seventeen and nineteen eighteen. Again, maybe less is the end point of Tsarism, beginning of the Soviet concept, but more is the frustration of these uh, federal ideas that are being developed in exile, brought back to Russia, and then are forced into exile again. So in that kind of sense, the, the exile and like the international kind of field of knowledge production becomes the norm rather than just the exception that grows out of the civil wars. It's already there before. 1917 opens this very uh, brief but promising window in which the federal ideas can come uh, into Russia and, and, and become part of the reorganization of the polity. Uh, so, so, so in that sense, I would say at least in the way that I imagine it, we see 1917 a, long, a longer arc that then kind of splits into different directions rather than just seeing it as beginning or the end of a regime. Because the regimes have their histories, but the networks uh, transcend them, I think. Uh, if, that, if that makes sense. I'm trying to, it's, it's a very good question, and I haven't thought about uh, the chronology in, in um, probably enough detail, but, but that's just my, my feeling for now. So what are the implications of the fact that they're there in Prague? I mean, it's 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 important for, uh, for example, intellectual history, mm -hmm. but in terms of larger implications, what, what does it what does it mean that they're still there, or do they die out with that generation, or do they have continuation within Czech Republic? Oh, it, okay, yeah. So so um, I don't know so much about the the Prague groups, but if I can talk about the ones in Warsaw, uh, maybe um, what. Uh, Polish historians have increasingly pointed to is that uh, the early Cold War Sovietology in the United States is indebted to the Sovietology that was developing in Poland, like in the mm -hmm. 20s or 30s, uh, which is, yeah, it, it was really fascinating. And I, I wrote a bit about it um, in the in the um, uh, the dissertation. And the, the point there was like, really, you know, when the United States is confronting the Soviet Union right after World War II, there is a shortage of people to actually, you know, who know the languages, who know the territory, and who are able to give uh, some some uh, guidance to the state. And uh, before the United States can uh, train its like first generation of homegrown Sovietologists, uh, the emigre knowledge is very important in shaping what people uh, in the West know about uh, Soviet politics or Soviet history. And that's still the time when the the national issue or the borderland issue is considered um, one of geopolitical significance for the U.S. Uh, if you look at like the you know McCarthyist anti-communism in the 50s, there are ideas about arming Ukrainian partisans or Lithuanian partisans and breaking up the Soviet Union along the, 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 the national lines. So um, I can say about the Russian socialist revolutionaries that uh, Mark Vishniak is very important. So he's the kind of mind behind a lot of the federal projects of 1917. If I remember correctly, he leaves, so he, he goes probably to, to France uh, in the interwar period. And then when World War II begins, he relocates to the United States. And his documents are at um, the University of California archives on the West Coast. And Vishniak, um, you can kind of contrast him maybe with Richard Pipes, who was also an emigre, but much more conservative and, and uh, totalitarian in, in terms of the view of the Soviet Union. Uh, Vishniak was a former SR, and he lectures about uh, Soviet history and geopolitics in the West. So although the exact connection there is sometimes hard to document, and I would have to go look at those archives in California, it's clear to me that the the um, federal ideas of 1917 oftentimes develop into theories of Soviet geopolitics uh, in the interwar period that then at least informed to some degree the uh, Anglo-American Sovietology of the Cold War. I wouldn't maybe overstate the estimate, or the, the, the importance of these specific uh, emigres, but I think at least in the very beginning, like in the 40s and 50s, uh, they're almost recruited as expert witnesses. Um, so, but then, then again, we're looking at, um, you know, uh, knowledge production intersecting with state power. So 
you know, maybe it's not just about knowledge production versus state power, but thinking about how they intersect in many ways. And in 1917, I mean, the provisional government is quite weak, right, in terms of its grasp over the country, but uh, the federal ideas are becoming state policies by the end of 17, beginning of 18. Uh, so I think that might be a good way to frame it, actually. So thank you for getting me to okay. think about it, because it hasn't yeah. really occurred to me before. <laughs> Sorry. I had to stumble through it a little bit to get to the right uh, yeah. conclusion, but I, I, I appreciate it. Then it has a very important yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I don't know if it's, it's, it makes sense to end it in 1940 or not. Uh, I mean, if I continue into the Cold War, that's a very maybe broad. Like uh, an maybe an epilogue. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, with the, um, the, the, the colonial, anti colonial nationalism, though, for me, that's always an interesting point about the uh, people from the Black Atlantic and from South Asia looking at the Soviet Union as a model for keeping the territories of the British Empire together under a socialist system. So maybe that'll be the epilogue about how the Soviet system kind of is internationalized or goes global at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of the Soviet threat, I think. Um, yeah. No, but thank you. I, I, uh, thanks for pushing me to, <laughs> to, to, to elaborate on that. Part. I think one of the most fascinating uh, points you mentioned is, is that moment where, uh, despite having initially these very different ideas about, about how this development can happen, you say that the, the Soviets essentially uh, co-opt the yeah. ideas of, of the SRs. And I was wondering if, if it, the, the, the project uh, in its current state sees uh, further reflection of those ideas in later stages of Soviet policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know how much how much that's part of the project as opposed to following what's going on outside of the, uh, the borders of the, the USSR. Thanks. Thank you for that, Chris. It is um it is a it is a really helpful question uh, because in the past I read about like the uh, the so called national communists uh, of the twenties, the ones who were ultimately uh, expelled from the party or purged by Stalin. Um, <clears throat> the national communists that I have in mind are like the uh, Ukapisti, the Ukrainian communists. Uh, who split from the like the left wing of the Ukrainian Social Democratic Labour Party in 17 and uh, gravitated more towards the, the Bolsheviks. And also with um, some of the Tatar communists like Sultan Galiev, Sultan Galiev, who are thinking about exporting the Soviet system um, very early on to the colonial world, like during the, the, the civil wars. Um, I want to follow that thread a little bit into the 20s, because those are thinkers um, who in 1917 or 1918, they're actually quite excited that maybe the Bolsheviks will create a more decentralized system and that like Tatarstan or Ukraine could really have its own uh, economic planning bureau that would be on the same level of that it's, uh, as, as that of the Russian Republic or their own military, or their own Red Army. And those uh, hopes evaporate very quickly when the union is actually consolidated in 22. Um, but these people like the Ukapisti, they remain active at something like uh, until 1925, 26, and they keep um, uh, appealing to the communist international saying, we're the legitimate party in Ukraine, not the Bolsheviks. At the point, they're a party of maybe a few hundred people. Uh, the Bolsheviks now have you know thousands, almost tens of thousands of, of people joining the ranks. Um, Sultan Galiev also tries to argue for a more decentralized federation. Um, so I think, yeah, for me, the, the, the main interest is maybe looking at the point when the federal system is still kind of uncertain or shaky in the 20s. Um, after collectivization, though, I'm not sure. I, I would love to pursue it further if it's possible. Um, the connection with the colonial world, though, is important, I think. Looking at the Bolsheviks from Central Asia, from parts of the Caucasus or the Volga region, um, that, that's been always at the back of my mind because I'm interested about how they were looking out on the world and thinking of, uh, you know, the federal system could be exported to India or to China or something like this. Um, the, the, the Chinese system of the 56 nationalities that um, was adopted by, by the communists, uh, originally there were some discussions about whether China, China could be federalized, um, although it's, you know, vast majority are Han Chinese, if there could be some decentralization for Xinjiang or for Tibet or for Manchuria or something like that. Um, so I do want to look at that as well. And I think um, maybe focusing on Communist International would be the Kind of the, the institution in which those ties were, were happening. Um, yeah, but, but there are people like Padmore, and the only reason I know about Padmore is because I was trying to find a source, a primary source for the course I'm teaching now that would connect the Soviet context with uh, post-war decolonization. And I find Padmore writing this uh, book that you can find, How Russia Transformed Her Colonial Empire from 1946, and that's very explicitly saying that uh, there's something to be drawn. Uh, so I think, yeah, absolutely, I, I, I do want to pursue that. In terms of what's happening within the Soviet Union, though, after 30s or 40s, um, I, I'm not uh, as well acquainted with that as I am with the 20s and 30s, so I'd have to, to read more, but uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know um, what the connection would be like for like Brezhnev or Gorbachev years, but definitely under Stalin, the world revolution is still kind of there. Uh, maybe one more point. Um, I think it was Tomasz Kamusela, uh, the Polish scholar. Uh, he co-authored a book that had to do with ethnic federalism in Ethiopia. And uh, the point was that like right when the Soviet Union was collapsing in 1991, also the uh, the Derg, the military um, revolutionary government in Ethiopia was falling, but a new Marxist or a new socialist regime took over and implemented the ethnic federalism as the way of organizing Ethiopia. Um, so there's this connection between Ethiopia and the Soviet Union that's like always been at the back of my mind for, for that. Uh, epilogue to the epilogue. Epilogue to the epilogue, epilogue yes. <laughs> But thank you for that. I, I think it's a very good, a very good point about yeah, thinking of the chronology too. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is a this is a great talk, and I really enjoyed it. I I'm, I don't have a smart question. <laughs> I mean, it's just have a comment that during the thirties, the European former Yugoslavia, there was a attempt uh, for a differently federalized state because mm -hmm. the king wanted to get rid of ethnic nationalisms mm -hmm. so he decided to divide into uh, to divide country differently into something called barnabinas in order to kind of break these nationalistic impulses within the country and then with the soviet model after the second world war they went back to ethnic kind of federalism Mm -hmm. uh, except for Bosnia, it's still, uh, <laughs> but um, that, that, that's interesting in terms of uh, federalism within Yugoslavia. But my question would be more, I really like your idea of development through time, and um, I just wanted, I'm curious, where did you get that idea, if you can say a little bit more, and how does the, the contemporary European Union federalism influence that idea, because it seems to me that now, European Union operates with this idea with you know different air type airs and yeah, tiers yeah, and yeah. different factors of member thing. Yes, yeah, with the EU, right? We're talking about the the nuts regions, right? Over <laughs> over that, I remember that as well. Um, I know, but uh, absolutely, um, I, I appreciate the Yugoslav connection as well, um, and and, I, and I'll think of that too because it is one of those examples of the socialist federalism that, that ultimately fell apart. Uh, the developmental time, it's something that. Um, Gosh, when did I read this book? Probably I was still in, in undergrad and I reread it in graduate school um, by Brian Porter at Michigan, um, the, um, How Nationalism Began to Hate. And he makes this argument about Polish nationalism in the like kind of long 19th century. Um, and he's asking the question of how like the right wing national democracy developed um, by 1905, uh, based on the observation that like with Mickiewicz, for example, or with the Romantic nationalists, like the Polish nationalism was very uh, open and progressive. It's about liberating um, enslaved peoples and colonized peoples all around the world. They didn't use the word colonized, but like uh, conquered peoples. Um, and in Mitskevich's time, uh, you know, Porter's making the argument there, there, there was the idea that Poland is the Christ of nations, right? That it has this messianic uh, purpose in the world. And Porter is making the argument that, like, when we think about ideas of um, Polish nationhood, a lot of the time we think about like the changing borders on the map, like, you know, did Moski want an ethnographic Poland versus Kusutski's like federal Poland? And what territories were they claiming? Is it, is it the Polska uh, ethniczna or Polska ethnograficzna? And Porter was arguing that like the spatial element is very important, but there is also this like third dimension that you don't see on the map. And it's the idea of how the nation is moving through time. And he argues that like the understanding of the temporality or time of the Polish nation in Mickiewicz's uh, era is very different from what it becomes when social Darwinism and other theories about social progress and race struggle or national struggle uh, start to develop in the 1880s or 1890s. So he actually like structures the book by looking at different moments in Polish intellectual history when the understandings of nationhood and time are shifting. And I realized that like it makes a lot of sense with the nations, thinking about nations moving through time. And his argument basically is that like for national democrats, there is no like redeeming endpoint to history. History is just a struggle among different nations and races, uh, fighting for uh, property, fighting for land, fighting for resources. Um, and Porter today, you know, he's very critical of the peace government and of sort of the right, right wing in Poland. The, um, he, he writes, you know, a, a lot of articles uh, criticizing the, the current system and saying it's a uh, not really reflective of Polish nationalism that was much more progressive and emancipatory in the past. Um, so I thought about federalism though, like with federalism, we're not just talking about like one nation, it's kind of a composite uh, 
structure that <clears throat> tries to manage many different national and regional uh, units or that, that are moving through time in different ways. And uh, Porter uses the term, he, he borrows it from some um, literary theory, I think, uh, chronotope. Mm -hmm. So chronotope can refer to like um, a literary mechanism, um, a way of expressing time in writing. Um, but he argues as well that it's a chronotope is, is, is there a nationalist thinking and that the nation itself is a chronotope. So I think federalism also is chrono a chronotope or kind of a composite chronotope that is structuring many, many other uh, chronotopes. Um, with European Union, I wish that I, I, I studied it a bit more, more formally um, with these models. I mean, maybe what interests me about, about the Union and also with the development politics in the world uh, since the 1980s, especially since sort of the neoliberalism and the Reagan and Thatcher years, uh, you know, is the idea that there was a normative model of going from uh, countries being uh, planned economies or state socialist economies to being uh, market economies in some way. Uh, so in that case, that is an idea about, you know, nation moving through time, but now that we are in this moment of kind of uh, what social theorists call late capitalism, what comes next exactly? Are we reaching a terminal point of development or is it, uh, is there something beyond this? Uh, are, for, for Poland, for instance, you know, the developmental trajectory, are we just trying to reach what, what uh, Germany or Belgium have right now, or is there another way of uh, going forward? And I think, uh, for me, that relates very much to like the idea of, you know, Francis Fukuyama and that debate about end of history. Uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the socialist federations, is the neoliberal capitalism the only like uh, viable model of standing or are there other possibilities? And I like to believe that there are other possibilities, but it's, um, yeah, in, in Eastern Europe at least, we're kind of following the developmental paradigms coming from, from the West. Uh, so I don't know, is that the end of history for, for <laughs> Poland or is there something uh, still around the corner? Like, it's, it's for me, it's quite, it's, I don't want to editorialize, of course, too much, but like the, um, yeah, the, the demographic uh, issues in developed countries, the large scale migration from poor countries that were once colon colonies of the rich countries, uh, is going to pose a fundamental model, a question for the, the welfare state model that we have in wealthy industrialized European countries. Are we going to have these huge floating populations of unskilled labor from colonies, or do we find a way of integrating people more into the society, into the labor uh, system? Uh, so I think it's, yeah, um, maybe I'm, I'm coming at it a different way from, from, from what you had in mind, but uh, for me, at least that's the connection to what's going on today. But the questions about time and development back then, they've taken on new forms in the 20th century, but I don't think that they've been resolved fundamentally. It's still an open question about how things will go. Yeah, uh, I wanted to take it in quite a different direction and, and talk about the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, since you've been working on federalism a lot, I'm curious if you have examples of attempts at uh, federation um, as a kind of breaking away from um, an empire in, in the 19th century. Because when I was putting together my article, I was actually quite surprised to find that I couldn't, I couldn't find earlier developed um, theories of federalism before Siberian federalism, mm -hmm. uh, Siberian, uh, you know, uh, regionalism specifically, uh, other than the United States, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is really quite curious. Uh, you know, Spain came next. Spain had a very interesting federalism, federalism and, and thinking with the Catalans, but it was, it was like a, it was, uh, you know, like 10 years later. Um, you know, Belgium had some interesting things that were earlier, uh, but it wasn't quite as strikingly presented because yeah. in 1863, there was this uh, manifesto um, basically calling for the creation of the United States of Siberia, which would be a federation and would break away from Russia and federate perhaps with the United States of America. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was just so, I, I, believe me, it was no part of my, you know, beginning argument to stake a claim about the uh, forefront nature of the uh, Siberian regionalists. So I'm just kind of curious about other regionalisms that, that you found in the 19th century, if you, if you go back that far. Yeah, and then I the tree. Yeah, so so the United States has been the, the main model that I see a lot of people referencing. So that definitely is the primary one. Um, I guess it's not quite breaking away from empire, but if we think about uh, Canada in 1867, uh, Australia right in 1900, uh, 
South Africa is a union of some sort. Um, I do wonder, yeah, if, 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 well, th th those are influential for the SRs in 1917. They're going to the British uh, Southern Dominions. Mm -hmm. But yeah, again, that isn't uh, properly breaking away from empire. Um, I mean, I do think about like the large states that emerged from the Spanish empire and, and uh, South America originally. I don't think many of them were initially explicitly federal, but they did have some degree of uh, decentralization. And uh, I've never seen any overlap between those and what's going on in um, Eastern Europe uh, or in the Russian empire. With regionalism, so yeah, of course, what do you think? Did either of you ever look at, um, at Austro-Slavism? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this idea that comes out sort of mid 19th century, yeah. I, I think first with the, the Czech yeah. nationalists, right? And you know, the, the, the famous statement attributed to, to Palatsky, right? The Czech mm -hmm. nationalist historian is that if, if, uh, if the Austro-Hungarian monarchy uh, had not already existed for the good of humanity, it would have to be invented. Right? Yes. This idea that, that it, it was potentially the best of all possible worlds to have exactly yeah. this this uh, this model here. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if, if you see any any direct influence between that line of thought and, and the Russian uh, Empire uh, mm -hmm. uh, Federalist. I think yeah, with like the 1848 revolutions and the Pan-Slavic movement, there's definitely borrowing uh, going on in that case. And uh, I think. Uh, well, even a little bit earlier with, with um, the Ukrainian federalists, uh, I guess Kostamara would be an example, like in the 1830s, uh, he's um, thinking about like a federation of the Slavic nationalities of the Russian empire, but the Ukrainians are living on both sides of the frontier. So he's, he's also thinking about extending that into um, Central Europe and, and uh, Southeastern Europe. I think that's absolutely um, part of the, part of the imag imagination in, in uh, the 1840s, uh, 1830s and 1840s. I have to think about other, examples there. Um, I mean, there, there, a lot of the times, I, I, this is not, again, a, a state that breaks away from another one, but uh, Switzerland is always on their minds, uh, even though it's very small compared to Russia. But uh, I, I think um, both with Drachomanov and with uh, Limanovsky, they are exiles who spend time in uh, Switzerland, like in the 1860s, 1870s and, and onward. Um, the idea for Limanovsky is more to replicate the Swiss model um, in, for, for, for the uh, former Commonwealth territories, for Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, um, well, Grand Duchy of Lithuania, as they saw it, and then right bank Ukraine and, and Poland. Um, yeah, so so that absolutely is important. And, and yeah, what, what Chris mentioned about the Ostrovism, I think, um, is, is relevant. I have to go look back at those Pan Slavic Congresses, though. I think that would be um, something very useful to look at. Uh, in the point, of course, it's like the, well, the Hungarian Revolution, right? It's the Russian forces coming in and crushing the attempt at. Uh, decentralizing. So I, I, I didn't uh, read very much about how that was uh, received at the time. Uh, but this absolutely makes sense. And maybe this is a bit further. It's more after 1905, like some of the Polish Marxists who are coming up with these federal ideas for Russia, like when the Duma gets shuttered and, you know, the progressive gains of, of 1906 are kind of reversed, uh, a lot of them actually moved to Galicia, to the Polish speaking part of, of, of Austria, uh, Hungary, and, and uh, try to adapt the ideas that they've formed in Russia uh, over, over there. Mm. With one of these thinkers that I look at, uh, Ludwig Kuczynski, he gets disillusioned with Russia by 1908 or 1909, and then he moves to, to Galicia and is, is working there. Uh, a lot of the, actually, the, the, the physical, like the books and the pamphlets that I'm reading are published uh, elsewhere, are published often in, in Lviv or Krakow or sometimes other, other cities of, of Austria-Hungary. Um, so this absolutely is, is, is interesting, but about, yeah, breaking away from empire, it's hard for me to, yeah. maybe that's kind of the point though, right? That uh, with the British empire and the dominions, it was more of a reforming empire from within instead right. of just breaking away. So that, that, that strikes me as interesting that they're thinking about reforming the empire instead of fragmenting, right? But, but as you said with the Siberian case, people, some people are thinking of seceding. Right, so it does seem uh, yeah. like there, there weren't earlier ones that were saying that I want to break away. I mean, obviously the United States. So that's uh, a big example. But, uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. um, very interesting. Yeah. I have a question here. Any other friends out there? I have one I want to jump in here. Um, I think we still have a second yet. Um, I want to um, ask about attention in this uh, idea of federalism, um, and namely the, the nation. Where is the nation in all of this? Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like federalism is this kind of um, sort of unstable 
uh, you know, moment between empires and nations, because ultimately, you know, we end up not with federations, but with nations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to go with maybe the Kosutsky idea, you know, he's famous for saying, of course, you know, um, I took socialism all the way to national independence, and then I got off the train, and now, <laughs> yes. it's, now I'm a nationalist, you know, and so, you know, you were looking towards the colonial world for, um, you know, these maybe, uh, you know, sort of overlapping points of, of interest between the anti-colonial nationalist activists and the metropolitan sort of, you know, post-imperial actors, um, but it seems like it's the anti-colonial, anti-imperial um, national ideologies that eventually win the day in the entire region. And so, mm -hmm. so what, what happens? What do we do with that? You know, um, I think I, we pointed out with the Siberian idea that it, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Austroslavism, it you know, didn't happen. I mean, um, you know, uh, we ended up, we went from empires through nations. So it is federalism then kind of this, like, uh, you know, Byproduct of the birthing moment of the nation state war, or is it a um, an alternative route that wasn't followed? Uh, you know, was it something that could have been but wasn't? Or, you know, um, again, thinking with the Piłsudski idea, you know, he was interested in federal ideas, but ultimately chose to speak a language of foolishness as civilization. Um, so, what do we do with the? Where is the nation in all of this, and how does it? Um, uh, I suppose, uh, um, you know, bring out that tension between the socialists and the federalists on the one hand, and then nations as um, mm -hmm. uh, both an idea and as a uh, historical reality in the wake of the war. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Those are all very intriguing questions. Um, when it comes to, right, nations and sort of nationality, and I think also questions of citizenship are important because uh, well, maybe the best example is the kind of French West, West African case that a lot of um, the advocates of colonial reform in, in West Africa, uh, they imagined that people would first and foremost be um, uh, citizens of the, the different individual territories that they were living in, but there would also be an overarching French, uh, French Union or French community citizenship, kind of in the way that you can have um, the citizenship of a European country and you have the EU citizenship by, by virtue of that country being part of the, the Union. Uh, so you technically have that, that, that distinction. It's interesting for me because um, when we consider nation states, uh, the idea is that they're kind of exclusive, right? That yeah. the national identity is the primary one and that it can't really uh, coexist with other identities on a similar level. Right. Um, and that's what we end up with in the region after the war. Very right, yes. All, nation all of these uh, fragmented little nation yeah. states with their borders. Um, it, it, it is a, an interesting question about the, the time timing of federation, right? So as you had mentioned, we have the empires around the world, then there are the federal experiments, and a lot of them don't really work out. They don't pan out, we don't win out on the map, and we end up with the, the nation states. Um, but for me, yeah, looking at um, the, the post-colonial world and also looking at Europe, um, there's a question with, with all of the tremendous uh, problems that we face today with uh, inequality, with climate change, with migration. Can we really solve them within these patchworks of nation states, or do we need to go for uh, some amalgamations that will allow uh, for, for more coordination or more cooperation? And that was the idea behind the, um, the post-imperial federations, right, in the, in the French Empire. So in a sense, there is kind of a contemporary urgency behind this project for me that the federal repertoire to the ideas, um, I think of them not just as being, you know, kind of some, some interesting uh, yeah, experiments that didn't work out, but for, for today, the, the questions that they ask about uh, territory and development and belonging and, and citizenship. Uh, these are still alive uh, today. And I, I think the nation states maybe solved them momentarily in the time in the 90s or early 2000s uh, when the Soviet Union had just collapsed and the United States was kind of the unipolar power, but the world is, is uh, changing in terms of, uh, yes, in terms of the, the migration, in terms of population, in terms of the challenges to nation states. And I, th th there is a question of how they can, they can deal with these things. Um, what is interesting, you mentioned uh, Piłsudski saying, yeah, he gets off the tram at the, the stop called the, 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 um, the National Independence, right? He's not going all the way uh, further. Um, it reminds me of something that Khrushchevsky was uh, saying when he um, like uh, opens or inaugurates this Congress in Kiev in September 1917, this Congress that ends up uh, declaring a model for, for Russia's federalization. He says, for us, and I'm paraphrasing here, he says, um, uh, I'm trying to remember how it is, uh, oh, yes. So, so like federalism is uh, uh, 
how is it exactly? Federalism for us is not just like a temporary stage on, on the way to nationalism or to nation statehood. Federalism is kind of the terminal point. And he makes the argument that like the Ukrainian Cossack hetmanate was incorporated into Russia in the past, uh, supposedly on equal terms, but that didn't turn out to be the case. So he's saying that uh, Ukraine has already developed this legal and political uh, alignment with, with the bigger Russian state. Now the key is uh, to, to decentralize it and to reform it. Um, and in reading about the Soviet case, like, you know, I always have the Bolshevik model of the federalism as a, a trans transitional model at the back of my mind. But for so many of these uh, thinkers, the, the federalism is still, um, you know, it's, it's for them, it's the arguably the end point of the long term uh, way of uh, structuring relations uh, among nations. And uh, yeah, so 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 that's um, there there as well. I'm trying to think, uh, it was, but you reminded me about Piłsudski as well, right? That for Piłsudski, uh, the point is to have kind of a civic Polish nation that incorporates multiple ethnicities or nationalities, um, and and at the same time there are the Polish Marxists saying we can do something similar. We can have a, a kind of cosmopolitan or inclusive all Russian nationality within which the Poles can can function as well. Um, so in that case, I think. Uh, the question about nation and federation, well, it, it, it comes down to whether different nations can develop properly in a federation with others and what the limits of the federation are. And absolutely, it's it's uh, with the post-colonial French-African federations, uh, the you know relations of power are not equal between the former colonies and the metropole. They're you know, economically unequal. And in, in the case of the Russian Empire, we get a little bit of a different situation because, well, where is the metropole of the Russian Empire exactly? Uh, Ronald Sunni makes the point that it's the a uh, multi-ethnic ruling elite as an institution tied to St. Petersburg. That's actually the metropole because the ethnic Russians are generally not uh, treated terribly much better than the people in the borderlands. Maybe at the end of the uh, of the empire, there are efforts of russifying the borderlands. But even so, ethnic Russians, you know, they, they are not like um, English people compared to people in India or metropolitan French people, you know, in comparison to, to Algerians. Well, Algeria is part of metropolitan France, so maybe the better example is, you know, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, yeah, that that um, that is a, it is an interesting point. But in, in the in the uh, case of the Russian Empire, there's the question of whether the borderlands can properly develop, uh, to, whether they can follow different national paths uh, within a common structure. And people like Kuzuski will say, no, it can't work. The uh, he, he uses Russia uh, Shlotkova, uh, it's a Centralna Centralna Russia, or um, probably I can't remember Redzenna Russia is the main example. So for him, the Zenda Russia, like uh, native uh, Russia, is uh, like the, the Russian-speaking parts of European Russia that kind of uh, radiate out from Moscow. That's how he thinks of it. It's the old Polish understanding of Moskva, like the early modern Muscovy is like the core of the Russian state. And Piłsudski is saying, in this case, the um, center of the state is so much more backward than the borderlands that the national different nations have to secede. But I think that perception changes, though, as Russia begins to industrialize, which is why I'm really interested in that moment about, uh, yeah, nations converging or diverging, not just being on the map, but like, are they converging or diverging in time? Uh, and it is a question today, too, like, uh, the, the, maybe the very last point would be that when the European economic community was formed in the 50s, for a brief time, Algeria was technically part of it, because Algeria was part of metropolitan France and was still fighting for independence. Um, but that it raised the question actually in the in the 60s, 50s, and 60s. Well, can we have a Euro Africa uh, that combines the European economic community with uh, Sub Saharan Africa and, and Northern Africa? That was still a possibility back then. And I think uh, Europe didn't go that route. But in the meantime, Africa has become more populous, has also a lot more problems with land shortages and, and, and uh, poverty. So for me, at least, the question of whether the federal systems can be useful in the future is still open. And uh, yeah. So are we going again from you know empires, federations, nations? Maybe we're not going back to empires, but what is the next form of polity that will help, help us deal with uh, global problems on a global scale? I guess. So, this was partially my question. And it's, what is an example of a successful federation? Hmm. It looks like an empire. <laughs> it goes back yeah. to that model. I mean, it's a great question about whether. The nation states who get got their autonomy before getting in federations mm -hmm. uh, guarant, are guarantees of a successful federation, mm -hmm. or its vice versa. And I think that's also another another thing to think of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that is that is interesting. So, like the European Union countries first are independent, then from the federation. But the Soviet model, the 
republics are created out of the fabric of, of this imperial territory in flux. That is a, that is an interesting uh, question of memory. Yeah, uh, for for the European Union, a very useful book is by Seth Jolly. Uh -huh. uh, it's called you know, European Union Federalism or something like that, and, and he. He brings together the kind of various ideas of federalism as part of the European Union. Just it's just a very helpful uh, overall look. So if you're not aware of that, one thing I wanted to ask you about was the the 1920s. Actually, um, as you were talking about my article, no, it's good. Um, and one of the things I called 1920s was the regionalist feast. Because throughout Europe, there was just so much interest in regionalism. There were so many theories. There were so many people writing. And, uh, and then basically throughout, it kind of was suppressed. Like Spain, as an yeah, example, yeah. Uh, where you have this very serious suppression. And I'm just kind of curious. And then in the 30s, you, you just have this real flattening of these alternatives. And I'm just curious how, if you saw that as well, and any kind of thoughts you might have on the tremendous difference between the 20s and the 30s and the post regional movement. That's absolutely the chronology that's always in my mind about, about what's going on at this point. Um, yeah, I think, uh, at least in the Soviet Union with the national communism, the heyday of that is in the 20s, and that's again flattened or pushed out in, in, in the, the 30s. Um, the Polish case is interesting though, right? Because uh, Kuzowski never actually creates the federation, but when he comes back in 1926, we're saying like uh, Yuzevsky and, and the people in the eastern borderlands get some measure of autonomy for the Ukrainian you know, speaking parts of Bolivia. Um, but the interesting part of that is it's like a very controlled decentralization that's meant to balance uh, the security of the state with some degree of uh, some incentive for the Ukrainians living in the borderlands. Um, so I think the maybe the, the turn to the state is like the definitive unit mm -hmm. uh, becomes stronger in the 30s. And, uh, I think it's maybe Zara Steiner or, or also Susan Peterson who points this out, like the League of Nations, that in the 20s, like the ideas of uh, supranational cooperation or like maybe grouping countries into regional or continental blocks, it's uh, much more vibrant than in the 30s after the depression starts, especially. And then the nation state becomes the unit of sort of economic uh, policy and uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the policies become more maybe restrictive or inward looking in terms of the nationalist movements growing in places like uh, Germany or I guess Spain with the Civil War as uh, an example. Uh, with uh, maybe another example would be with the Promethean movement that I um, was mentioning. Like in the twenties, the Promethean movement is is definitely dominated by people who are former socialists, well, socialists who got out of the nationalist stop of the Zutsky sort. Sorry. But people like Hovuk, Hovuk or Leon Vasilevsky, who are still like uh, talking about reorganizing Eastern Europe along federal lines, and they're thinking of it kind of with an almost a social democratic framework, like Vasilevsky. Uh, you know, it's a close associate of Kusutsky's until his death in 1936. So it's like one year after Kusutsky dies. He's still thinking that, you know, like the European social democracy has a chance in Poland and that really can, can uh, uh, prevail. But Prometheism becomes much more right wing, I think, in the 30s. And the Prometheans of those years, they're much more eager to look to Mussolini, even to Hitler, to Shola, Japan, or to Chiang Kai shek and, and China at that time as uh, models for proper nationalist movements. Um, so maybe in that sense, the idea of a nation becomes more insular than it was in the 20s, or at least uh, there is a, a, even more hesitancy to divide sovereignty between nations and federations or re regional projects. Uh, I think the Depression is probably a big part of that turn. In, the, in, in Europe, in the Soviet Union, probably collectivization with uh, the national communists being reined in. But the 20s definitely, like in Ukraine, uh, yeah, with, with the Skripnik or Kvilovi, with these... Uh, what do they call it in Ukraine? It's like the Vidrojenia um, Vistralania or something like the executed or the, the um, re renaissance that was shot, like mm -hmm. literacy, literally. Um, so yeah, absolutely, I do have a feeling that there was a shift from the 20s to the 30s with the people I'm looking at. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very useful. Um, think about the interwar period. Oh, we is, can uh, slip in one more question. Yeah, this is, and it's perhaps good that it's it's last because it's kind good of a uh, somewhat presentist question. No. I really, I, I'm curious because on, on one hand, this is and also maybe perhaps a more sort of temporary Russian centered question, but the on one hand, you federalism in its sort of 
in this stage when it seems to be such this globally popular idea is has a fairly poor batting average. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. yeah. doesn't really develop into a sort of successfully executed political program any anywhere really. Um, but at the same time, like the idea of federation, or, uh, just thinking of, of Russia, which it remains this like extremely powerful rhetorical trope, even though I mean Russia is only a federation so far as it you know, outsources that unpopular decisions and, and costs to the regions. Um, why why it finds this idea which developed in, in you know in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which had which was popular but didn't really have any sort of uh great successes to its name why has it remained in eurasia this extremely open popular idea in russia yeah it's absolutely i i think uh, sarah, sarah you probably have the or susan you have the answers as well um and i think yeah it is a question well it's 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 an idea that's developed uh sort of radical right uh groups and it gets appropriated by the state and like a lot of uh, radical and, and uh, emancipatory ideas the state incarnation becomes much more centralized. Uh, it, it is an interesting point because maybe the traditional narrative is, you know, that the, the Soviet nationalities project was kind of doomed to fall apart. But really, before Gorbachev, uh, at least maybe not in the Baltic countries or in Western Ukraine, the, the national issue was, was stabler than, than we might think in, in retrospect. And I hear similar things about Yugoslavia in like the 60s or 70s that it wasn't. Uh, well, under Tito, at least, it's 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 uh, well, they really started to come apart in the eighties with with uh, and probably that's oversimplification, but I I, I I've heard it. Least. The, the the models um, become sort of this this bedrock. Well, yeah, it, it, maybe it goes back to Sasha's point as well that the the Bolsheviks um, they don't create the nations out of uh, all cloth or out of nothing, but they institutionalize the nations in a way that's very effective and. Poland in the interwar period tries to do similar things in its eastern borderlands, but it's a very poor and weak and small state that, that uh, uh, doesn't ultimately succeed in doing this. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking in, in Russia today, the federal territories, I mean, you have, you know, Tatarstan, you have like the Volga region. I know that there was like the Tatar regionalist movement in the, in the 90s and even some talk of secession, but what comes after secession, like you're still totally surrounded by Russia. Uh, if we're talking about uh, yeah, Al Altai Republic or, or, or parts of uh, Siberia or Central Asia, these are still very economically tied to the center. Uh, it's the, the Union Republics that become independent, but in the 90s, early 90s, even like the Central Asian leaders uh, and some of the Caucasian leaders didn't want to break away because they're in Belarus as well as a good example. Uh, so even though those countries are independent, uh, they're, they're still, they, they trade with China a lot more than they did in the past, but they're still tied to Russia economically and, and politically within this Eurasian Union. Um, I think it is the, the institutional building, though. It's not something that the radicals do very effectively because they don't hold state power, but the Bolsheviks are the ones who often decide the terms on which national identities are structured. That's my understanding, at least, of why the system was relatively durable in the 20th century, despite all of the wars and the crises that were happening. Uh, I don't know, Susan, probably have a more, more yeah. informed idea than, than mine. <laughs> um, sometimes you, you can look at it at different levels, because if you look at the EU as sort of like super national. Uh, federalism, uh, as I mentioned, that Jolly book and, and others, it actually is pretty successful. So, I mean, I guess it, it all depends on on how, you know, what, what's your framework? Mm -hmm. I mean, does it have to be a state that's kind of divided up and it's federal, or it could be a federation of existing states? Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes the latter seems to be doing quite a bit better, and that could be part of the reason. Uh, because if you had if you had a system that was sort of like the EU but for Russia or Utopia right now, then you could be like Tatarstan and you could be a part of this sort of Commonwealth or or, or something like that. So I, I think that you know that it is part of that, and certainly the EU is in, in much better shape than any other places for a lot of reasons, but. You know, there there has to be some kind of connection in order to make it in order to make it competitive, right? Because if they were just literally individual individual states economically, it couldn't be competitive um, with China or the U.S. So I think there's kind of a trying to bring it together different, and this is actually part of the problem with working on federalism because it's like, is it 
Is it a, a state or like in this country, when we talk about the federal government, we specifically are not talking about the state government. We're talking about, you know, the, the central government. And then we talk about federalism with the EU or you can talk about, you know, federalism and the Soviet Union and such as it was, you know, and these are very, these are very different levels and very different images of, of federalism. Yet they all have this kind of, they have, they have similarities. Uh, and so, yeah, maybe it could be also that fungibility that's, mm -hmm. like, oh, we could do this and that. Uh, it's a, it's kind of a good thing to, to think with, you know? So. Yeah, I think it's exactly that, that, that I see in a couple of points in Czechoslovak history where, you know, both in the late 60s and in the early 90s, when it seems like the word federation is just used almost as a talisman. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just like a federation is is the solution. We just need to get to federation, whatever federation is. It's almost like, it's like Erwan and Utopia. <laughs> it seems to me also that in Russian case, federation is an excuse for the hegemony. Of course, yeah. 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 It's a big thing. Yeah. But in, in, in more richer, and the rations I think that distribution uh, is more, it's different. But the Tatars are trying to use ideas of federation to kind of get to a more equal distribution, for example. So they, and you can use it from different angles. Yeah. 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 It's interesting because it again goes back to the, the, the point you raised that kind of the successful federations that we think of sort of closely resemble empires. Mm -hmm. The federation mm -hmm. has kind of belongs into the same sort of phylogenic tree as <laughs> as, as as sort of the 19th century empire land empire um and its sort of development as, as an idea is, is very closely linked to this um, but it's also very anti-imperial i mean the yeah. people who are writing about federalism tend to be pretty anti-imperial so you know in, in terms of where they're coming from tension I remember um, uh, Alexander Semyonov had written about sort of the tendency to look at the U.S. model or like the English-speaking world as the normative sort of source of, of legitimate federal models, but he pointed out uh, you have not just Russia, you have Nigeria, Brazil, you have India and Pakistan as uh, Malaysia as, as, uh, is the, which one as well? Yeah, I say India. Is India. And the, whole, the Indian federal system is really interesting because it was... Um, it's changed since the 1950s, but the model that came out of the partition in 47 was based on the uh, British uh, Government of India Act from 1935, which distinguished between the princely states and the provinces and tried to create a federation. It was more of a divided rule strategy, though, than genuinely devolving power. But I, I always found it interesting that for a few years after independence in both India and Pakistan, that model remained on the books rather than just being struck as, a, as, as an imperial uh, survival. Um, the, both India and Pakistan needed to integrate the princely states with. Uh, the, the provinces that have been directly ruled by the British. Uh, so it crosses that line as well. That's great. I know that we, we well, uh, is this, if somebody has a kind yeah, of interesting thing at the end yeah. of our most interesting things came out. Um, um, I think we do have to end. Yeah. Uh, so let's thank uh, Martel again. Oh, thank uh, all for you wonderful talk. Great session two. And, Absolutely. Uh, this will help us out. <laughs> great, wonderful. Yeah. And good luck with the rest of your semester. Thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. And let's uh, continue the discussion as we uh, move around. <laughs> as we certainly. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. the time of this. I'll find a historical. I